This episode is sponsored by the online learning community, Skillshare. What is up, Solo Cups? My name is John Solo, and I want to be the first person to welcome you to the best part of the internet. This is Messed Up Origins, the show where I take the most famous myths, fables, and folklore from all around the world and figure out where the hell they came from. And now that the spoopiest month of the year is finally upon us, it's time for me to break out the spoopiest of folklore, and the child-devouring Slavic witch known as Baba Yaga will be starting off this year's lineup. Now, Baba Yaga might just be my most requested topic to date, besides Norse mythology, so I know that a lot of you have heard of her, but for those who haven't, she's a pretty freaky lady. To give you a brief overview, some of her most notable characteristics include her consumption of human flesh, kidnapping of children, her house that stands on top of chicken legs, and the skeletal remains that make up her fence. Doesn't she sound lovely? Well, that is just the tip of the iceberg. I've got even more disgusting details and disturbing stories coming up, but first, I do want to make a special announcement that this is actually the 100th episode of Messed Up Origins. Oh, thank you, thank you. No, seriously. You're you're too kind. No, I'm not the best. You're the best. Seriously. You guys, I just, I don't just... Derek? What the fuck are you doing here? I've gotta say, it's pretty insane that we made it this far. If you told me back when I uploaded the first episode exactly three years and nine days ago what this series would become, I'd probably poop my pants. I talked to you guys last week in the three year anniversary video about how Messed Up Origins basically gave me a whole new purpose in life. I went from being some nobody with no job and no plan into a nobody who gets to tell stories for a living. And no matter how this party ends, whether it's tomorrow or 10 years from now, I will always consider myself to be so impossibly lucky to have had this experience and gotten to share it with this incredible community. Can we just hear more about this bitch who eats kids? I was getting to it. So chances are, if you're watching this video, you've at least heard of Baba Yaga, and that isn't very surprising considering how many shows, movies, and video games she's been referenced in. Everything from Scooby-Doo to Hellboy to The Witcher 3 have all included their own versions of the witch. Baba Yaga is also the name that assassin John Wick is known by. Had to mention him, of course. But while each of these portrayals contains some truth inspired by Slavic folklore, they all manage to be very different from each other, resulting in people all over the world having a variety of ideas about who or what Baba Yaga is. Ipso facto, I think the best place for us to start unpacking her folklore would be at square one, her name. What does Baba Yaga mean, if anything? Well, like most of the iconic parts of folklore, all we can do is speculate, though we're pretty sure about the first half. Experts believe Baba stems from the Russian babble word for grandma, like how in English, mama means mother and papa means father. In old Russian, it could have meant sorceress, midwife, or fortune teller, and in modern Russian, Baba could be used to describe a foolish or dirty woman. There is no definitive answer, but I'm sure you're noticing a very fitting theme of old, mysterious, kind of gross lady. As for the meaning of Yaga, that one we're pretty unsure of, but some theories suggest a connection to various Slavic words that mean anger, horror, shudder, and wicked wood nymph, though that last one seems a little on the nose. Now, when it comes to how she's portrayed, as you've seen so far, she's not exactly at Trisha Paytas's level of hot. She's actually quite gross. In about 99.9% .9 of cases, Baba Yaga is described as an ugly, decrepit woman with razor-sharp fangs and bony legs, resulting in epithets like the bony one or straight up the bony legged. A Russian poet named Nikolai Nekrasov wrote a poem about her in 1840 that gives my favorite description of the Witch. It's called Baba Yaga the Bony Leg. He claims that the devil cooked 12 evil women in a pot together and the result was Baba Yaga. And he describes her as wearing a toad skin cap and a snake skin coat and having sharp fangs, nostril hairs that hang down to her breasts, huge ears, horns on her forehead, and holes instead of eyes. Okay, maybe she is as hot as Trisha Paytas. Just about every story Baba Yaga is featured in makes note of her flying around in an oversized mortar, which she steers with a pestle. Quite the departure from the witches we're familiar with that ride around on brooms, but Baba Yaga is said to carry a broom sometimes too, only she uses it to sweep away evidence that she's been somewhere. Maybe the only thing more iconic than her vehicle of choice is her not-so-humble abode, which stands on a giant pair of chicken legs and is sometimes said to have a chicken head planted on top. In some stories where Baba Yaga is pursuing a runaway victim or is the one who's being pursued, the house will stand up on its legs and run in whatever direction she tells it to. According to legend, this is why Baba Yaga's house is so hard to find. 
it's always moving. Now, if you're wondering why the house was specifically given chicken legs and a head, unfortunately, we only have theories, but the one I thought was most interesting said it was to represent Baba Yaga's resourcefulness, as the legs and head are considered to be the least useful parts of the chicken because they have less meat. And I actually think the fence around her hut corroborates this theory because it's made out of the bones of her previous victims. Hey, say what you will about Baba Yaga, but at least she's eco-friendly. So now it's finally time for us to get into the stories featuring Baba Yaga. And while I normally like to start with the first time a tale is put into print, the first time Baba Yaga's name was published wasn't in a storybook. No, instead, it was included in Mikhail Lomnasov's Russian Grammar, where she's mentioned twice in a list format among other figures from Slavic mythology. What's interesting, though, is that the second of the two mentions is in a list of Slavic gods next to their Roman equivalents, and Baba Yaga is shown not to have one, signifying that she is distinctly Slavic. Now, as far as the stories about the witch, here's where things get even more interesting, because she doesn't really have stories about her, but rather she's featured in the adventures of other characters, and her role in their adventure can vary significantly. I mean, so far I've only mentioned the fact that she eats children and uses their body parts as lawn ornaments, but she can actually be a pretty sweet old lady. Now, I'm not saying she's Betty White or anything, but there are stories where she plays a nurturing grandmother-like role. That being said, this is messed up origin, so we're not talking about any of those today. Instead, I'm going to tell you some of the darkest and most disturbing stories included in Alexander Afanasyev's collection, Russian Fairy Tales, published back in the 1800s. The first of which is Vasilisa the Beautiful. You can think of this one as the Slavic Cinderella, where Baba Yaga is the fairy godmother. We're not in Disneyland anymore. So this one starts off like all the Cinderella stories start off. Mom dies, dad remarries a manipulative wench, the wench has two bitchy daughters, and they treat Cinderella, or in this case Vasilisa, like human garbage. The big difference in this version though is that when Vasilisa's mom dies, she gives her a little doll and says, keep this hidden from everyone, and whenever you get into trouble, feed it some food and ask it for advice. It'll help you out of all your troubles. College loans. So in this story, whenever Vasilisa is sent off to do chores, she gives the doll some foods and it does them for her while she lays low somewhere. It's really a pretty good system, but one night when Pops is out of town, the stepmom sees her opportunity to be even more cruel than usual and takes it. She tells Vasilisa and her two daughters they have to spend all night weaving lace, knitting stockings, and spitting bars. I'm sorry, spinning yarn. Then only gives them a single splinter of wood, basically a matchstick to use for light and goes to bed. Well, as you'd expect, that light lasted for about three minutes, and then the sisters throw Vasilisa out the door into the wind, rain, and mud and tell her to go to Baba Yaga's hut and ask for some more light. I don't know exactly why it was mandatory she'd go to Baba Yaga's. I'm sure they had other neighbors, but that's what she did, following the doll's directions to get there. When she first saw the house, she stood there, frozen with fear for a while, when suddenly the witch herself came rolling up in her flying mortar. Vasilisa bowed low to Baba Yaga and humbly asked for a light, to which the witch responded, sure, but only because your stepmom is my cousin. Okay, I don't know if they were cousins per se, but she does call her kinswoman, which means they're related somehow, a fact I find pretty hysterical. But here's the deal, Yaga ain't just gonna hand over a light, okay? That's a valuable commodity, so Vasilisa's gotta earn it, and what better way of earning it than doing chores that are borderline impossible? For example, remember how in the Grimm brother Cinderella, her stepmom makes her sift through a pile of ashes and pick out all the lentils and she has a bunch of birds help? Well, Vasilisa has to do basically the same thing, organize a bunch of tiny little seeds, only instead of not going to the ball, her punishment would entail being killed and eaten. Fortunately, she has the doll help her out with this and succeeds, which infuriates Baba Yaga, of course, but she tells Vasilisa to just go to bed. Plot twist, though. When Yaga thinks Vasilisa's asleep, she tells the maid, who apparently has just been standing around this entire time, to heat up the oven because she's going to cook Vasilisa in the morning. But once again, the doll comes to the rescue. While Yaga's asleep, it gives the maid a fancy silk ribbon and tells her to pour water over the log so they don't burn right and that'll give Vasilisa time to escape. The maid agrees and Vasilisa runs right out the door into the dead of night. But before leaving the property, she grabs one of the glowing skulls off the fence and uses its light to guide her way through the forest and back home. Now there's actually an alternate version that's way more preachy, similar to how the later editions of Grimm Brothers fables tend to be, where instead of running away, Vasilisa tells Baba Yaga that the way she's completing all of her chores is through the blessing 
blessings of her dead mother. When Baba Yaga hears this, she starts screaming about how she won't have a blessed one in her house, shoves the girl out the door, then hands her a glowing skull from her fence to find her way home. You can go with whatever exit strategy you like better, but the story isn't over yet, because when she brings her magic lantern home, its light slowly cooks her stepmom and sisters over the course of the night, and by morning, all that's left is three piles of ashes that blow away in the wind. Tell me, is that more or less satisfying than birds tearing their eyes out of their sockets? Now there's actually a bit of an epilogue here that I'm just gonna speed through. Vasilisa moves into town with some random old lady and weaves her a super nice piece of cloth as payment for letting her stay at her house. Only instead of selling it, the old lady takes the cloth to the czar, who decides he must marry the woman who crafted such a lovely garment. Then Vasilisa moves into the czar's palace with her father and the old lady and she lives happily ever after. Like I said, basically the Russian Cinderella, but Vasilisa isn't the only story featuring Baba Yaga that is incredibly similar to another fairy tale you know. There's a story called Baba Yaga and the Peasant Children that has the exact same setup as Hansel and Gretel, only instead of a witch living in a house of candy, they stay with Baba Yaga. That's right, no candy house, just a hut with chicken legs. How disappointing would that be? Now when the boy and girl arrive at the hut, they actually have to say a magic phrase to enter it. Hut, hut, turn thy back to the forest and thy front to us. Then the hut stood up, turned to face them, and sat back down. Interestingly, I found that phrase in just about every Baba Yaga story I read, except for Vasilisa's. Despite that, the boy and girl are given the exact same treatment as Vasilisa was in the last story. Baba Yaga said they could live with her since their parents can't afford them, but if they can't do their chores, she's going to eat them. The boy and girl agree because they don't really have a choice, but of course are given chores that are nearly impossible to complete, like filling a metal tub with water when it's riddled with holes. But lucky for them, there are various little creatures on the property, like mice and cats, that help them get it done. As usual, Baba Yaga is furious about their success and plans on eating the kids anyway, but you'll be happy to hear that they do escape. Yaga had some defense systems in place, like her cat that would claw them, her dog that would bite them, her gate that wouldn't open, and the trees that would slice them, but the boy and girl managed to bribe them all to let them pass. Apparently, despite working for the witch for years, she never once rewarded any of them. So when they were offered ham, cookies, grease, and a ribbon, they collectively said, I quit. As you'd expect, Baba Yaga wasn't too happy about this and proceeded to beat the cat, kick the dog, smash the fence, and chop down the tree, but I think they would all agree that their sacrifices were worth it. Now there is one last story I want to share with you, and it's no doubt the most epic of the tales we've covered today, though you are going to recognize a few elements in this one too. The story goes by two names, the death of Koshe the Deathless or Maria Marevna, and like our previous two entries, is of Russian origin and was collected by Alexander Afanasyev for his collection. It follows a prince named Ivan, who while on a journey, meets, falls in love with, and marries a badass warrior queen named Maria Marevna. And after a year of living in total bliss together, Maria tells Ivan that she has to leave for war and that he's in charge of everything while she's gone. However, he's not allowed to go near the dungeon. Now, if you've seen my video on the Bluebeard story, you have an idea of how this is going to go. Ivan, of course, doesn't listen to instructions and immediately goes to the dungeon. Only instead of finding the corpses of his wife's previous lovers, he finds a single emaciated old man in chains. The old man begs Ivan for some water, claiming it's been years since he's had any nourishment, and Ivan takes pity on him. This idiot brings him not one, not two, but 12, that's three, 12, I don't have enough fingers. 12 kegs of water, and when the old man finishes the very last drop, he takes his true form, the sorcerer known as Koshe the Deathless. He then flies out of the dungeon, pulls Maria right off her horse, and carries her far away, somewhere that he vows Ivan will never be able to find. You'll be happy to hear that he does find her though, only the first few times they meet don't go super well. Ivan tries over and over again to rescue Maria, but no matter how far away they get from Koshe's territory, his wicked fast steed is able to catch them. On Ivan's third attempt at a rescue, Koshe finally says enough is enough, and he chops our hero into pieces, puts those pieces into a barrel, and throws the barrel into the sea. But no, that's not the end. And trust me, I wish it was. I'm so tired. See, Ivan's three sisters were each married to wizards, the falcon, eagle, and raven wizards to be precise, and they were able to not only resurrect Ivan, but give him some valuable advice. You see, Koshe had actually gotten his wicked fast horse as a payment from Baba Yaga for successfully herding her horses for three days without losing one. And if Ivan wanted to risk his life and soul, he could attempt to do the same. And while I'd love to get into the nitty gritty details of how he managed to do it, if you were listening to the past two stories, then you already have an idea. 
Yaga. He was assisted by the various critters around Baba Yaga's property who he had previously shown kindness to a bird, a hive of bees, and for some reason, a lion. Much to the frustration of Baba Yaga, they were able to corral the horses on Ivan's behalf, therefore earning his prize and giving him one last chance to save his love. Our hero rode his steed into Koshe's territory, pulled Maria onto the saddle before she could even say, wait a second, I thought you were dead, and rode towards home as fast as he could. It wasn't long before Koshe was right on their heels, but this time Ivan's horse could maintain some distance from the sorcerer, giving them the advantage. Instead of trying to outrun the evil wizard, the steed was able to kick up his hind legs, essentially denting Koshe's skull, then Ivan took out his club and battered what was left of it. My man had to be sure that Koshe was really dead though, so he dismembered the corpse and burned the pieces. After the deed was done, he and Maria rode into the sunset. Ivan on his own steed and Maria on Koshe's, and they lived happily ever after. So as you can see, Baba Yaga has played quite a few roles throughout the centuries. Granted, they're all very similar roles, but you can't deny that her inclusion in these stories is a major wild card. You never know what chores the hero will have to do, what the reward is going to be, whether they'll get a reward at all, or if they'll even survive the encounter. She adds mystery, suspense, excitement, horror, and a little bit of sex appeal to the fairy tales that we'd otherwise already know the endings to, and for that reason, I really appreciate her existence. But the question remains, exactly how messed up are Baba Yaga's origins? You might remember that back in August, I made the Messed Up Fables tier list, where I ranked all the fables we've covered by how messed up they truly are, and I want to keep that list updated with every installment of this series. So when it comes to Baba Yaga, we have a lot to consider. On the one hand, she does use children as slaves before killing and eating them, but on the other, she can be pretty nice. I know we didn't talk about any of those nicer stories today, so maybe it's unfair for me to take them into consideration, but I would feel disingenuous if I didn't. It's also worth noting here that while Baba Yaga may be a trickster and has her potential victims compete in games that are rigged against them, it's not like she forces them into this position. They volunteer for it without always thinking of the ramifications. My gut instinct was to put this broad in the S tier, but after taking her rare instances of kindness and the fact that she doesn't really bother anyone unless they bother her first into consideration, I'm gonna go with the B tier. I'm curious to know your thoughts on the witch though, so if you wanna make your own messed up tier list, there's a link to all the materials you need on my website. If that's too much effort though, just leave a comment down below, and while you're doing that, I'll tell you all about this week's sponsor, Skillshare. So I think it's safe to say there's not a single person watching this who wants to be terrible at everything they do. Now, if for some reason that is you, I'm sorry about your childhood. But for everybody else who actually wants to fulfill their potential by mastering some sort of craft, look no further than Skillshare. You can think of it as an online learning community where millions of creative and curious people come together to hone their skills and take their creative talents to the next level. Whether you want to learn how to take better pictures, invigorate your imagination through the art of illustration, or even bring your drawings to life with the magic of animation, they've got you covered. One class that sparked my interest is the Productivity Masterclass with Ali Abdal. Being that I'm a one-man production and always wishing I had more time to finish my to-do list, I'm hoping this guy's got some useful tips for me. It doesn't matter if you've been working at your craft for years now or you're just picking it up for the first time because Skillshare has literally thousands of classes to offer at every level of expertise. Not only that, but you can take each lesson at your own pace, start and stop it whenever you want, and as a whole, most classes are shorter than 60 minutes long. Yeah, that's how fast you can learn something new that improves your life in ways that you can't even imagine yet. Skillshare is also crazy affordable with a year-long membership costing you less than $10 a month. But if you want to try it out for free, you just have to be one of the first thousand people to follow my promo link in the description. Sign up through that link and see if Skillshare is right for you. Solo fam, thank you all so very much for tuning into the 100th episode of Messed Up Origins. I already got all my gross, sentimental feelings out in the intro, but just to reiterate, I love you, please don't ever leave me. If you haven't already, make sure you give that like button a safe for work kiss with tongue, subscribe for weekly content just like this, and share this video with your friend, sister, brother, mother, father, coworker, doctor, garbage man, personal chef, shoe shop. Also, if you want to stay updated on Messed Up Origins news, like what topics I'm covering next or when I upload, follow me on social media, because apparently YouTube's notification system is taking this year off. And if you can stand the sight of this little monster's face, go follow him on Instagram. Seriously, how can something be so cute and so ugly at the same time? I'll see you folks again next Friday with another spoopy and special episode of Messed Up Origins. Until then, my name is John Solo, and remember, John shot first. Thank you.